what we're talking about here is is a layered causality. You know, a, a one traffic crash is not just as it's not the you know caused by one driver's behavior, you know, their lack of personal responsibility. We're talking about layers of systems, the design of the car, the design of the road, when that road was designed, the speed limit on that road, the age of both the cars that crash, the wealth of the drivers in those cars, which will dictate the technology that's, you know, the safety technology in those cars based, you know, because NHTSA isn't regulating that technology in. Um, and, you know, that even leaves out, you know, weather conditions, for example, um, or what's going on in those two people's lives as they're, they're driving down the road. And so all of these factors matter. Um, and the thing I try to encourage and, you know, that I see a little bit of hope in is that ac- so-called accidental death is not cancer. It's not COVID. We know how to solve it. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Sounds channel. I'm John Zimmerman and that was Jesse Singer, author of the new book, uh, There Are No Accidents, The Deadly Rise of Injury and Disaster, Who Profits and Who Pays. And we're gonna go into some of the details of the book, uh, but we certainly don't cover everything. So I highly recommend that you pick up a copy if you haven't already done so. Uh, It's a a long one, again, (laughs) so let's get right to it with Jesse Singer. Jesse, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. So, Jesse, uh, you have just written a, a fabulous a new book, and it, we're going to dive into the details on that. Um, but I'll, I'll just kind of pause just for a second and let you introduce yourself uh, to the audience. Uh, tell them a little bit about who Jesse Singer is. Absolutely. Um... I'm a journalist and the author of There Are No Accidents, um, The Deadly Rise of Injury and Disaster, Who Profits and Who Pays the Price. And the book examines the history of the word accident in the U.S. and the current catastrophic rise in um, these uh, so-called unintentional injury deaths. Um, and accident, you know, which is a, is a tricky and often manipulative word, is a word that I don't use in my day-to-day life. Um, But um, I think it's important that um, we all kind of come to understand when it sounds weird to us and when we kind of allow it. So I'm going to use it throughout this interview um, so you can all notice uh, when it starts to trip you up. Um, It's probably important to give a little backstory on the book. Yeah, Um, yeah, please, please, uh, please do. Yeah. And I I was going to just interject one little comment uh, and then I'll have you do the the backstory. And uh, I'm the same way. I, I stopped trying to stop say the word saying the word accident years ago and so listening to the book i listened to it on audible and i do have a, a hard copy as well it was hard <laughs> it was hard to listen to it but uh i'll let you uh, continue on we can talk a little bit more about that later because i think it's significant to and you t- address it in the book uh but yeah give, give a little backstory as to how you came to this absolutely um So in 2006, um, I was a working journalist um, and my best friend and high school sweetheart, uh, a 22 year old man named Eric Ng, um, was riding his bike on a separated biking and walking path that runs along the west side of Manhattan. Uh, He was killed there um, on that biking path um, by a drunk driver. That driver mistakenly turned and entered the bike path. Um, He was drunk, he was speeding and he went to prison Um, and of course that, that day changed my life. Um, but the reason I wrote this book happened 11 years later, um, when a different man rented a truck and followed the exact same route as the man who killed my best friend, turning onto the bike path and traveling downtown. Um, except this man intentionally turned onto the path. He killed eight people and severely injured 11, um, in an act of vehicular terrorism. And I was so shocked that the exact same thing had happened again under these different circumstances that I looked into it, the place where my best friend died. And I found that other people had been killed um, before Eric and after on this same separated path. Um, And every time the drivers were different, you know, some were drunk, like the man who killed Eric, some were distracted, some were lost. But every time the story that was told was it was an accident. And so no problems were solved until this act of terrorism. And after the act of terrorism, the city and the state got together and they made the harm impossible. 
they barricaded every entrance to this biking and walking path so that a car could no longer fit through. And I mean, it, it was an action that could have been done decades ago and would have prevented massive amounts of harm, except so much of that harm was chalked up to being an accident, that nothing was done. Um, and it was the first moment I realized that accident was this sort of magic word, a, a sort of willful ignorance um, to give us an out from preventing preventable harm. Yeah, yeah. And uh, certainly from, from my perspective, uh, I have a background in public health and then you know, sort of started really focusing on the, the built environment and how the built environment encourages healthy, active living. And so design is very much a part of the way the system's thinking that I think in, in terms of how the design of our communities, how the design of our public spaces um, influences behavior. And uh, you, one of the things that you mentioned about with the, the change that did finally happen to that particular cycle path is they changed significantly the design to change behavior <laughs> or, or help make it much more difficult for uh, even, uh, e even a, a, an intentional mistake and or a terroristic activity to, to happen. Yeah. And I think that's such an important point because I think it's so easy for us to get wrapped up in, in blame, in finding a bad guy, um, in identifying a culprit, in seeking a cause when, when these frightening things happen, whether they are a, a so-called accident or an act of terrorism. But the truth is that the path to harm is the same and the, the uh, mechanism is the same, which is that there is dangerous propulsive energy, which uh, a human body can't withstand. And the solutions, therefore, are the same that, you know, we simply need to put a pillow between us and our mistakes. Um, and that works across the vast realm of injury related death that we call accidents um, and a great deal of things that we call crimes, too. Um, but we often miss that the simple ability to prevent harm because we're so focused on who did what wrong. You know, and people say to me, they say, shouldn't we punish drunk drivers? And I say, well, you know, the guy who killed my best friend, he went to prison for eight years and it did nothing. It did nothing to prevent this from happening again. Yeah, yeah. Well, there, there's a difference between, and you talk about this in the book of, you know, that, that part of us that wants to seek um, some sort of, of, um, reparations for it versus actually preventing something in the future. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, so. it's something I ask, ask audiences a lot. What, what do you yeah. want to do? Do you want to punish someone or do you want to prevent this from happening again? Cause you can't do both. Right. Yeah. So I, I do want to pop over to uh, your website real quick. So this is the landing page for, for your website. Again, it's jessiesinger.com. Uh, and I'll make sure that we have the link uh, to your website uh, in, in the show notes. And, and uh, we've, we've got uh, you scroll on here. You've got some selected writings here. What on earth were you typically writing about prior to really diving deep into the whole of of, of, of these events, you know, these accidents? Well, after Eric was killed, I actually left a career in journalism and um, moved into transportation policy, essentially taking the skills I had as an investigative journalist and applying that uh, process of deep dive research and um, uh, concise argument building um, to changing how New York City managed its streets. Um, so a lot of my writing um, before I specifically became deeply obsessed with the word accident and the ways that injury related harm manifests in society um, was about the inequities of our transportation networks um, right. and the harm caused there. 
Yeah. And you just you, you threw a word out there, the inequities of, of our transportation system. And you talk about this in the book is it's not just our transportation system, but also uh, all the many other ways in which <laughs> we fall victim, um, you know, to these incidents, these events, these tragedies that take place. It's not just out on our roads, but the inequities, uh, you know, seem to be fairly consistent as to who falls victim to that. Why don't you bring us up to speed with the realities when we look at, what is it, nearly 170,000 people per year in the United States that will fall victim to what we call accidents? Yeah, and this is actually um, a hard truth is that as I was wrapping up the book, the newest statistics were from 2019. Um, but by the time the book was published, 2020 statistics um, had come out. So that 170,000 people killed by accident um, a year number jumped to more than 200,000 the following year. And we don't yet know um, the numbers for 2021. Um, but those more than 200,000 deaths are, um, are not at all um, something that falls equally across the country. You know, we often talk about accidents as being a matter of randomness. Um, but um, if you look at the numbers, um, accidental death is divided along racial and class lines, particularly accidents that are affected by the built environment. Um, and I think this is what's really important to, to note. Um, people who insist that injury-related death is just an accident often talk about it as a matter of personal responsibility. Individuals who weren't paying attention or who made bad decisions. Um, but if you look at all of these things called accidental death, you see that that's not true. For example, pretty much everyone in the country, generally, irregardless of where they live or their race or their class, um, chokes to death on food at the same rate. Accidental choking is pretty a universal. But if you look at other types of accidental death, accidental deaths that are infected by the resources people are given, the spaces where they live, um, the vehicles they drive, you see significant inequities, um, just to name a few. Black people are killed in house fires at twice the rate of white people. Indigenous people are struck and killed by cars at twice the rate of white people. People in West Virginia, a very poor state, are killed by accident at more than twice the rate of people in Virginia, a wealthy state just miles away. And so what we're talking about here is different types of resource allocation and infrastructure you know, offered to different people. And it's clear evidence that what matters in accidental death is not randomness or personal responsibility, but the built environment that we're all offered. Yeah, yeah. I spent a fair amount of my uh, early career in the uh, the area of health promotion and disease prevention within corporate environments, and uh, you know because large corporations actually have a vested interest to try to keep their 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 employees healthy if they're if in fact they are uh, covering their healthcare costs. I mean, it literally hits their bottom line uh, for every uh, heart attack that happens, every stroke that happens, and so. Uh, there, there is that vested interest. Well, also a part of that was injury prevention. And so uh, sort of in my department, we also had a little bit of that going on too. So that part of your book, when you were looking at some of the, the you know, the workplace uh, injury prevention techniques, so much of it sounded familiar. I'm like, oh yeah, I remember that stuff. Um and, but it's interesting too, it's, and, and you addressed this earlier when we were, you were talking about how we want to blame somebody, that narrative is consistent in that environment too, of the workplace. Of, it's like, oh, they just weren't paying attention. And, and you had all these elaborate programs and systems that are in place um, to try to deal with that behavior of that employee versus actually addressing the infrastructure, the system, the design. Talk a little bit about that because I think it's it's informative to when we get back to transportation, because inevitably we will, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's consistent there. It, it's a fascinating thing because what we're talking about here are, are deep psychological crutches that we all have, stuff such as like the fundamental attribution error, which is our tendency 
to see our own mistakes as caused by the circumstances we're in at a, a moment, but everyone else's mistakes as being their own personal fault. And, and we fundamentally misattribute our errors um, to such a degree that, I mean, besides having a phenomenon named after it, like we do it in the face of all evidence to the contrary. And I think one thing that happens with in the corporate environment is they not only, you know, are corporate leaders, you know, guilty of these same psychological crutches, but they also take advantage of them because they're profitable. Um, and if you look back at the history of workplace safety, you know, in times like the Industrial Revolution, when the leading cause of accidental death was going to work and um, work-related deaths were massive, um, unimaginable compared to today's numbers, um, the only thing that changed that was when um, the conversation stopped being about who was at fault, um, whether a worker was drunk or screwed up or put their hand in the wrong place. Um, and the advent of workers' compensation laws, which essentially said that if you have an employee on the job and they're injured, you have to pay either way, um, that it is your financial responsibility. Um, but I think there's a few things we're seeing today that um, are really affecting you know, worker injury rates where generally the world's gotten safe enough that it's it's less likely to die on the job. You know, in places like Amazon warehouses, we're seeing skyrocketing injury rates, repetitive use injuries, you know, muscle, muscle, muscle and skeletal injuries. Um, and part of this is coming from the fact that the cost of these injuries is built into doing business. Amazon's already budgeted for it. Um, and that makes it very easy when reports come out about how Amazon warehouses have these huge injury rates makes it very easy for Amazon to say, hey, we've introduced a new program where we teach our employees to stretch and we give them meditation rooms, which of course is total bullshit that won't help reduce the injury rate at all. Um, but it provides this narrative that says, don't look at us, don't look at our uh, dangerous environment that we're providing for our employees, don't look at the dangerous pace we're forcing them to work look back at the employees, pay attention to them. They're just not stretching enough. They're just not meditating enough. Um, it's a very insidious trick that we kind of fall for because we're already prone to seeing other people's mistakes as being the product of their personal failures. Yeah, yeah. And to channel the uh, the narrative of the construction site, the work site, we'll we'll pull up a tweet here from uh, from Tom Flood, a good friend of mine and a former guest here on the podcast. And you know the t caption here says, "Dad, are are we working on the construction site today?" No, son, we're just going for a bike ride. <laughs> and again, I mean that's it's a theme that kind of flows through. It's, it's like it, there's this subtle sense of of blaming of of you know like rather than dealing with the underlying issue of that's a you, you don't have a safe network to be able to ride on we're going to shift the responsibility over to the father and son of having to wear protective gear and high vis this and 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 all these sorts of things it's such a distraction to what is the core issue and the core problem it's interesting, too, because automakers and the departments of transportation have been more successful at this than most corporations um, at changing the onus of who is responsible for safety. You know, where, where you, you know, today, I think most Americans would say, you know, people deserve a safe work environment, you know, and that is like writ into law. Um, we see, um, you know, the, the regular um uh, expenditure by departments of transportation on huge amounts of money on ridiculous uh, public service announcement campaigns that essentially tell drivers or pedestrians or cyclists, be safer, do a better job, you know, and, and essentially the whole time they're you like, mean like the, this? yes, <laughs> we're not a pumpkin. Don't drive smashed. But like, there's, there's a secret message here, right? And the yeah. secret message is like the, you know, the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain saying like, I'm not, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not here. I'm not responsible for the roads, right. um, you know, and, 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 and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just this mysterious force of a Department of Transportation typing up puns to put on billboards <laughs> when the only people who can affect the conditions on the road are those Departments of Transportation. Yeah. 
I loved it when I saw that tweet from you. <laughs> I was like, you know, David, uh, you know, had that piece and it, it, it's fantastic. And, and it's so right. And But I had to smile and laugh because I'm a Smashing Pumpkins fan. So <laughs> I was like, okay. Um, and, and it is interesting too, because we do see some of those things. Sometimes we grab, we, we reach and grab for straws of any kind of effort to try to increase awareness about um you know, the, the fact that so many people are perishing and so many people have life altering injuries, um, you know, out on our roadways. And yet it, it just, you know, it, it's like a small jet airplane crashing every single day, day after day, week after week. And yet nobody talks about it. And so when we do see, you know, any kind of sign of any sort of uh, acknowledgement of the fact that there is a death toll out there. You're like, okay, can I get excited about this? Oh, wait, no, there's a subtle shifting of responsibility and blame. And, ah, ah. <laughs> but uh, I mean, how I've been of the mindset in the last 15 years of working in this arena that, um, that the general population is just completely unaware but I think it's changing. But now I'm starting to wonder whether they just they may not be unaware, but they just don't feel like there's any easy answer. And maybe easy is not the right word, but legitimate. I don't I don't know. I'm, I'm grabbing I mean, at this. <laughs> I mean, you know, like all injury related death, what we're talking about here is is a layered causality, you know, uh, a, one traffic crash is not just as it's not the, you know, caused by one driver's behavior, you know, their lack of personal responsibility. We're talking about layers of systems, the design of the car, the design of the road, when that road was designed, the speed limit on that road, the age of both the cars that crash, the wealth of the drivers in those cars, which will dictate the technology that's you know, the safety technology in those cars based, you know, because NHTSA isn't regulating that technology in. Um, and, you know, that even leaves out, you know, weather conditions, for example, um, or what's going on in those two people's lives as they're, they're driving down the road. And so all of these factors matter. Um, and the thing I try to encourage and, you know, that I see a little bit of hope in is that ac so-called accidental death is not cancer. It's not COVID. We know how to solve it. Um, we just need to start tackling each of those layers of things that go wrong. Each, each little bit of safety, um, you know, that's got a hole in it where the danger is eking through, um, you know, and we, we can do that by redesigning our roads, um, by regulating our vehicles, but also by, you know, reestablishing the social safety nets so that people aren't driving older cars as long because newer cars are safer, um, you know, and they're, you know, able to, you know, protect themselves to, to drive less far for work because they don't have to drive so far because the, the further job might pay better. Um, and so I think that there's a lot of potential in all of those layers, but I also think you're right in identifying that, you know, people have trouble seeing a better way because the danger is so layered, right? Uh, you know, and the one thing they have control of is, you know, when they cross the street or their two hands at two and 10, you know, and that that offers some, I think, comfort, that semblance of control, you know, because, I mean, no one would ever leave the house if they thought about how dangerous our roads really are. Yeah, yeah. Well, Peter Norton and I were talking about the fact that, uh, you know, we've been promised this for years and years and years. <laughs> and you had a tweet that kind of, you know, channeled a bit of that as well here and, and talking about the, the fact that um, it's, yeah, it, I mean, the technology is, is, is out there. I mean, we have the technology to make our roads um, safer at many different levels in the, in many different systems. Um, but as you mentioned here, it's much less comforting to recognize that it was no accident. It's built in, it's baked into the system. These are results. It's yeah. I mean, predictable results. Um, yeah. there's a, there's a reason it's the same number every year, pretty much, you know, yeah. I mean, um, you know, and, I, you know, in, until we start to take action on, on, on all those different levels, we're going to keep seeing that. But, um, 
you know, I also think from a personal level, like blame is a food chain and it's really easy to look at the bottom of that food chain at, at the one person who crashed that one car and say they were driving crazy. I mean, that's especially easy because we experience it every day. You know, we experience drivers who seem uh, who frighten us, who seem crazy, you know, who seem like nuts behind the wheel. And when we're afraid and, and a way to reestablish control when we're afraid is to find a bad guy and to blame them and to get angry. Um, but it doesn't do anything to solve the problem and actually really distracts from it. Yeah. So you just use the phrase nuts behind the wheel. And there's an entire part of the book that, you know, goes into some of the history behind. Uh, and, and Peter and I talked about this, too, the 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 history behind the, the term jaywalker. And, and uh, why don't you go ahead and, and share that? We do have an international audience, so it, it might be something that uh, maybe nobody had heard the, the term nut behind the wheel. So go ahead and give a little bit of that history. Absolutely. So, so the nut behind the wheel is a, a, a phrase that appears in, in various cute and punning uh, formats. Like there are, you know, there are 12,000 parts of a car, but there's only the only thing that matters for safety is the nut behind the wheel, which is to say um, that driver behavior is the only thing that matters for safety. Um, and this concept um, that when people died in traffic crashes, it was because of the nut behind the wheel, um, you know, begins to rise with the first major rise in traffic fatalities as automobiles become more popularized. Um, and it really does stick around as a conception of what went wrong in any given traffic crash. Oh, the nut behind the wheel, oh, the dangerous driver. Oh, that driver wouldn't stop screwing up. Um, and what's really interesting about this story is when it changes. Um, which is um, with two very important people, um, a, a man named Hugh DeHaven, um, who is sort of the father of crash injury research, um, who's the first person to figure out that injury is a matter of impact, um, that the reason we get hurt is not because we were nuts, but because of what we smash into. Um, and so he goes on to patent the first three-point seat belt. Um, and another thing he does is he spends a year with the Indiana State Police uh, studying crash photos. And what he's doing is not studying how the driver behaved. He's studying the driver's injuries and the passenger's injuries. And what he finds in those injuries is the most dangerous parts of cars. Um, and the most dangerous parts of cars are steering columns that don't collapse on impact and thus impale the driver, uh, non-padded dashboards, sharp dashboard knobs that, you know, pierce skulls upon impact, um, uh, window glass that shatters, causing, um, you know, uh, people to bleed to death, doors that pop open on highways. And he has this, he has this whole list um, and what's interesting about this story is, you know, Hugh DeHaven, you know, he really wanted to believe that the automakers wanted to do right. And so he held a conference um, with all of the auto companies. And he says, here's a list of all the most dangerous parts of your car. It's not the nut behind the wheel. I figured it out. It's, it's actually these parts of the car and you can just make them safer. And then even if someone is nuts, the impact won't kill them. And so he, he sends the automakers off with this. And then for about a decade, it's just crickets. The automakers don't really do much of anything to the point that they were holding the patent on the collapsible steering column, a steering column that wouldn't impale a driver in case of a crash, but not putting it in their cars. Um, uh, the airbag was in, uh, invented in, the, in, this, um, in this generation in the, in the 1960s, uh, but it wasn't mandated in cars until 1998 um, due to automaker resistance. Uh, and so what happens next, about 10 years uh, after Hugh DeHaven comes to the automakers is Ralph Nader writes this seminal book, Unsafe at Any Speed, where he broadcasts DeHaven's research to the public. And the public, along with Congress, is outraged and brings Nader in for hearings and forces the automakers to testify. And this leads to the creation of the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the first real regulations on automakers um, that actually force them to put seatbelts in their cars and eventually to put airbags in their cars to, to, to make their steering columns collapse, um, to actually reduce the harm of injury 
uh, regardless of whether the driver is nuts or not. Um, and it's this pivotal point because it, it takes the blame out of the equation, right? Like, yeah. who cares if you're nuts? You can still survive. Yeah. I love it, too, that you channeled uh, Ralph Nader in all of this as well. I'm old enough to remember when all of that happened, and I'm old enough to, to you know, relate to this graphic uh, directly because uh, I started driving right about 1980. And uh, I, I remember, you know, the cars were much different scale. And so, you know, you were just ad addressing the, um, the dangers that lurked inside the motor vehicle. And of course, you know, in the case of the Corvair and, and what, what, what Ralph Nader was looking at was, you know, that particular vehicle was <laughs> notorious for, uh, you know, being a traveling bomb, <laughs> or, you know, very, very, uh, and there were others too. I think one of the Pentos that was out there, you know, had a, 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 a gas tank in the, in the rear that had a, a propensity for catching on fire. But, um, what, what, what sort of shifted in this sort of timeline is that we've shifted a lot of the, uh, the risk from the driver to uh, everybody who's outside of the, the vehicle. And a big part of, of that reason is because of the, the supersizing of what we call our regular automobiles, as well as um, what we end up seeing, you know, out on the road that passes, uh, you know, as uh, some form of, you know, necessary you know, vehicle and, uh, you know, the, with the SUVs and, you know, when you have in the United States, the most popular um, motor vehicle purchased year after year is the F-150 uh, from Ford. And then, you know, probably one of the Dodge Rams is not very far behind that in terms of uh, overall sales numbers. They're just massive these days. I grew up driving trucks. I mean, I grew up on a ranch. We had at least two pickup trucks at any given time for, for hailing bales of hay or hauling bales of hay and, and pulling a horse trailer and, and, and doing work, real work. Um, that was what I grew up with and I can relate to that. But even the trucks that we have every once in a while, I'll see one from the sixties. I'm like, Oh yeah, that we had that truck. And I look at it compared to the, these behemoths and, and this next you know image gives it more context is that they're just massive. Um, and that gets back to what you were talking about earlier of, of the resistance of the automakers to understand their role in, quote unquote, the design, because we're still talking about design. We're just not talking about design of the road right at this moment, but we are talking about design, design of motor vehicles. Absolutely. And, and it's funny because one thing Ralph Nader talks about is that one of the greatest tricks the automakers ever pulled was getting us to focus not just on the, uh, the nut behind the wheel, but on road safety. Yeah. Um, because road safety doesn't cost General Motors or Ford anything. Yeah. And so they can insist, you know, it's all about the design of the road and it takes the onus off them to be designing safe vehicles. Yeah. Another important thing, you're port, important thing you're pointing out is that, you know, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and all of these consumer based regulatory programs are for the consumer. And you know what? Pedestrians and cyclists are not the consumer. You know, so the, these giant vehicles are protecting the consumer yeah. um, while putting everyone else at, at outsides risk. Um, and and it's it's such a funny thing about how styling like. There's no need for these big trucks. It's just styling. It's just yeah. it's just making it look interesting. And like I, I've heard from from people who do you know manual labor and that um, like those trucks you were talking about from the 80s and 90s have become incredibly valuable because these gas guggling like mega tank trucks aren't valuable for like farm labor. They're just simply they don't make any sense for that kind of work. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a really messy proposition. Um, and, you know, NHTSA up until now has refused to take it up. I think there's a lot of hope on the current NCAP process, you know, of the, you know, um, advocates around the country have been uh, for the last few months and the, the deadline is any day now been pushing NHTSA to incorporate pedestrian and cyclist impact testing into their safety ratings for vehicles, right. um, no notably um, Europe and Japan started doing this in, um, 
in the early aughts. Um, and at the same time that pedestrian fatalities have been rising in the U.S., they've been falling in Japan um, yeah. and Europe. Yeah. <sighs> <laughs> I'm going to pull up another image here from Tom. Uh, <laughs> I love Tom so much. Um, in in this particular image, you know, by law, children have to wear protective, uh, you know, protection out there, but our mobility lanes do not. Gee, makes perfect sense. The sarcasm is there. And I, I just, you know, it's, you're, you're absolutely right. It's so incredibly complex. There's so many different layers to this. And, um, certainly from a, the, from a manufacturing perspective, the automobile industry has been, you know, very, very adept at, um, at shifting, helping shift the blame and, and, and what, you know, it's like, oh no, it's not us. It's not, not behind the wheel. Oh, it's not us. It's the jaywalker. Oh, it's not us. It's the road design. Of course, the road design is bad. <laughs> and that's part of the point that Tom is making here. But to your point, it, it's so many different multi, multiple layers of, um, I don't want to use the word responsibility, but I want to use the causal, you know, you know, root cause of the situations that we have. But it doesn't have to be that way. We know how to do this. And I think that you point this out elegantly in, in the book. What's holding us back? Oh, oh, so many things. Um, I mean, I think, I think there are a few major factors here. Uh, chief among them is regulatory capture. Um, the reason we have giant trucks that NHTSA won't regulate is because the auto industry owns NHTSA. Um, you know, there's just a, uh, you know, both sides of the aisle run on anti-regulatory agendas, you know, from, from Reagan to Clinton, we've had, you know, nothing but largely anti-regulatory uh, presidents since the creation of these agencies. So th they simply, they don't have the funding, they don't have the staff um, to do the work, and they're pretty much politically discouraged from doing it. That's a major factor. Um, you know, another is how we spend our city's budgets. You know, I think I think DOTs often feel like they don't have the money to redesign streets the way they want to. And one of the reasons is that huge portions of cities' budgets go to police enforcement. And police spend, at least in New York City where I live, spend most of their time dealing with parking infractions. Um, and so huge amounts of money are going to having a few people chasing drivers around in something that is totally ineffective as a procedure. Um, you know, we have no evidence that uh, police enforcement uh, reduces traffic fatalities. We actually have evidence that police enforcement doesn't reduce traffic fatalities. Um, so the money isn't there. But then I also think that there is a lack of a desire to take responsibility, you know, from the the most important people, you know, I always say blame is a food chain. Look to the top. If you're looking at the last actor, the least powerful, you know, the dangerous driver or the jaywalking pedestrian, the cyclist who didn't wear a helmet, you've lost the thread if you're looking at that person. Um, because, you know, the places where we see success in reducing injury related death, whether it's um, accidental drug overdoses or traffic crashes, um, is where the most powerful people are responsible. Like in Sweden, you know, when they take on Vision Zero, they don't spend money, you know, having cops chase three drivers around the road or putting up signs that say don't speed. They redesign their roads. But this is the important part. When they redesign the road and someone dies on it, they turn to the traffic engineer and they said, someone died on that road you designed. How are you going to fix it? And then they create a new rule. They fix that one street and that one street says that this is, this is what a street looks like where no one's going to die. How do we put it in the next intersection? How do we put it in the next intersection? So responsibility, the responsibility for life um, sits with the most powerful people rather than pretending through scolding or punishment, we can somehow force responsibility onto the least powerful people which is a way to focus on prevention, not cause. Right. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, you you mentioned NHTSA there, and one of the thing that's, things that has always irked me and annoyed me about NHTSA is their over reliance on coming out with you know oh we our pedestrian fatality rates are high oh our cycle fatality rates are, are are getting higher and what do they do they go right to this theme they go right towards oh well you know don't be distracted when you're walking make sure you're wearing high vis clothes make sure you have lights on make sure you're wearing a helmet make sure that you when you're walking to the corner store wrap yourself in bubble wrap because you'll probably need it <sighs> Uh, so uh, I hope they're, it's getting better over there. I don't know that it is. I hear, I see signals that w- there might might be hope that things are changing. I know there's some good people over there, but their history just really drives me nuts of that. The other thing that, you know, is, is out there, of course, is, you know, we, <laughs> we, we, we have this, you know, o- o- you know, continual theme of, of, you know, we, we're telling this we're we're imploring people just hey drive slow down just drive safely but again the design of our roadways the systems that are in place everything just encourages that and then you know folks will just get frustrated and say well we need more enforcement and you just you know address that that's not the solution what is the solution you channeled the uh, the Swedes and and of course the Dutch also you know really take a, a much different approach to it they take a systematic approach to safety and they look at road design actual things to be able to try to slow motor vehicles down and then they evaluate and if it's not working like you said they turn to those engineers and those planners and say why is this not working what do we need to do but the reality is, is for, for us, what we're doing is this. We put a sign up. <laughs> you know, and it, it kills me, right? Like these signs assume that people are so perfect and paying so much attention. And yeah, I just think it's so ridiculous. I mean, driving's really hard, yeah. first of all, it, you know, but also like, People are stressed, people are busy, people are broke, people are on their way to work. And to assume that they are paying so much attention, and first of all, that they're paying so much attention and that if they were, these nudges work, that right. like reading this sign changes their behavior, is just so divorced from everything we know about human behavior. Right. It just disregards everything we know about human behavior. And those Dutch, uh, I think this is important, those Dutch designs we were looking at, what they do is they accept that drivers are imperfect, maybe a little dumb, maybe not paying attention, and selfish. You know what a narrow road does? It makes the driver feel unsafe. Right. And so they slow down because they feel. Yeah. And Nicholas did a good job of also pointing out some of the the little design techniques that that they use to to create that perception of narrowness and so he as he goes yeah look check this out the topiary you know it's like yeah these little hedges and these things that narrowing the the field of vision and and making it seem even more cramped than it really is and again narrowing that up really helps naturally through human behavior naturally helps slow the motor vehicle you know, speeds down. The driver, as you point out, you know, they don't want to scratch their vehicle. They, you know, it, it's, it, and, and I don't mean to be flippant about this, but um, because they, I don't believe as Hans Monderman, you know, once famously said, uh, drivers don't have, you know, for the most part, a, a, a desire to run over children. So, <laughs> but we need systems and, and, uh, designs in place that encourage uh, people to behave when they're behind the wheel in a way that is not homicidal <laughs> and murderous, uh, and 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 helps reinforce the behavior that we're we're, we're looking to do, and do so in such a way that just doesn't it, turn it as a cop out of we'll put a sign up. Absolutely, I mean you know we just are we're building roads for perfect people. Right. Um, with the presumption um, that everyone will do better, except occasionally those people who might need to read the sign to be reminded of how to right. be perfect. And the problem with that is that everyone suffers then, you know? Right. 
uh, in this punishment modality, in this idea that we need to scold our way out of this problem and sign our way out of this problem, everyone suffers. I mean, it's not just that it doesn't work. Yeah. It's that like that attitude leaves us at a point where we're never saying like, you know what? People might not be paying attention. Let's make sure they're going to pay attention. Right. Um, how can we induce that with our design? Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, because inherent in, inherent in the education model, right? Yeah. That's what this is. The sign model in yeah. the education model is a desire to punish people. Yeah. Didn't you, didn't you see the sign? Yeah. The sign said, slow down yeah. and you didn't slow down. And, and I think, I think, I think that that urge, um, it just constantly drives us away from actually saving lives. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes the safest places <laughs> out on our roads are the places where the average driver would feel like it's, it's dangerous. Um, I, I channeled Hans Monderman, um, Ben Hamilton Bailey was also a shared space advocate and, um, the, the, the concept again is that we're creating a situation where it feels uncomfortable to the driver. Um, and, and therefore that attention perks up, just like you just said, it's like, oh, I have to pay attention here. I can't just go into sort of auto mode here, automatic drive and just cruise through here and allow the the size and the comfort of this road, this lane to dictate what feels comfortable for me as I motor along. Uh, Tom Vanderbilt had a, a, a story in his wonderful book, Traffic, from many, many years ago of where, you know, the, the difference between that narrow mountain road that, you know, winds up and has, you know, a few signs of skull and crossbones and things of that nature. And you just feel like you're going to plummet to your death versus, you know, when he got off the plane and he got on one of the massive highways and nearly was nodding off because it just it felt comfortable and, and speeds, you know, which was which, which is the more dangerous street, you know, roadway. One would say, and the driver would say, oh, it's that narrow mountain road where I could plummet to my death. And yet that ends up being the safer road. The Hans Monderman Street that actually was part playground and children were, you know, in the street and, and motor vehicle drivers are compelled by sharing the space to slow down ends up being an incredibly safe place for children compared to what we have out our doors in North America. Yeah. One thing that's interesting related to that, I spoke yeah. with a NASA um, behavioral scientist who studies how people interact with automation. And he mostly does this for pilots who use autopilot quite right. a bit. But it has serious outcomes for our roads as uh, autonomous vehicles proliferate because all our autonomous vehicles operate the same way autopilot does, which is the autopilot flies and you have to jump in if something goes wrong, right. which is the same thing that our AVs work right now. And essentially, he just said to me, like, based on what we know about human behavior, that's the absolute wrong way to do things, because we're perfectly fine at driving and then having the machine say, oh, 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 you're getting too close. Oh, mm -hmm. oh, oh, you need to stop here. But when we have to monitor a machine, which is kind of like driving on the highway, you know, it's just plodding along, not paying much attention, not doing much straight line. We just zone out. Our right. mind goes other places. We think of other things. And the same thing, it happens to pilots, it happens to drivers. And so we're setting up all of our automation based on this model where we're monitoring the machine. And of course, we're going to space out because it's just like driving on that straight, endless highway. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, Jesse, what can the average person do that, you know, somehow they, they found your book? And, you know, and when I say average person... Um, I think that, you know, what's great about whenever one of these books comes out is, you know, obviously they sell quite well within our bubble. <laughs> you know what I mean? And but every once in a while they start to, to trickle out into outside of the bubble and the quote unquote, the mainstream you know, start, starts to clue in. Um, for, so it's a two-part question. One, do you get a sense that it is trickling out beyond sort of the the, the quintessential, the typical um, traffic safety bubble? And then the second part to that is uh, what can the average person do to really affect change within our communities and our societies? 
Absolutely. It's an interesting uh, question. And, and I do think it's trickled out. You know, the book's seen coverage everywhere from um, NBC to the New York Times to the Washington Post, you know. Um, and, you know, part of that is that it's not just about traffic. Um, it's about this larger phenomena of all these preventable harms that we chalk up to accidents. Um, but you were mentioning earlier di your discomfort listening to the book and hearing the word accident again and again. And it's an interesting thing about our little bubble. You know, a number of people have come to me from our bubble where, you know, no one says the word accident. And they're like, why did you do this? Why did you say the word accident again and again and again? Um, and I need to be like straightforward with them that, you know, it was something I agonized over. There was an entire draft of the book that didn't include the word. Um, but the conclusion I came to and the reason I made the word so ubiquitous in the book was because people in our bubble were not my audience. And if I open this book with word policing, if I open this book by saying this is a bad word and you shouldn't say it, I lose them all off the bat. Because, you know, people who, you know, ride bikes and walk on city streets and, you know, feel that danger on a daily basis, they understand that none of these aren't accidents. But I don't think that your average American does. You know, I think that there's a really strong urge to believe in that randomness and that idea of, you know, personal responsibility being able to save us all. And if I was going to persuade those people, I needed to bring them along with the language they knew until they started to see the problem. And that kind of gets at, I think, what people can do. I mean, when it comes down to it, two major factors are going to change the paradigm here. Um, you know, we need our streets redesigned and we need our automobiles regulated. And we also need a social safety net that allows people to make safer decisions on the road, whether that's taking work that pays less, but's closer to home um, or buying a new vehicle that's safer. And all of these factors are going to help. But there's also so much you can do locally. If you can transition from a blame mindset, a punishment mindset, a mindset that says, we're gonna educate the drivers out of their bad behavior. And one that focuses on harm reduction, um, that looks at the road and the vehicles that travel on it as uh, potential harms that we can mitigate, um, that we can mitigate by controlling their speed, by controlling their likelihood of impact, um, by separating the dangerous energy of vehicles from fragile human bones in space and time on the road. Uh, and I think, you know, people listening, your audience probably knows a million ways we can do this, but it really does require saying, um, when people die on the roads, I want to know how I can reduce the harm of crashes. Um, you know, when I see an unsafe street, I want to know how I can reduce the harm of it. Not how I can get angry at that one driver who seems to be driving so fast, because when it comes down to it, the environment is begetting that behavior, you know? Um, and if we're focusing on how angry we are at that driver, we're never going to solve the problem. Something I also like to say is, um, that I don't say the word accident in my normal day-to-day -day life, um, but a conclusion I came to after spending 300 pages on the word um, is while I don't think anyone should say the word accident, what's more important is that you hear the word accident as an alarm and that that alarm makes you ask questions and ask them out loud. Um, you know, was it really an accident? How was it an accident? Why would you call it as an accident? You know, could it happen again? What are we doing to prevent it from happening again? And I think if we can hear the word accident and respond rather than with word policing, but with those questions, we can start to bring people along to manifest actual change. Yeah. Yeah. I love that too, because it's like, it, it's, it gets to the point of the root cause, you know, could it have been prevented? How can we prevent it? you start to really answer, you know, start to ask that question and, and look towards that answer, which more likely than not is going to be some sort of design related, um, you know, answer that comes back, whether it's a roadway design or it's a design of equipment in, in a workplace and, and systems design and systems. Uh, yeah. Fantastic. 
Jesse, it has been such an absolute pleasure. I'm going to pull your book up here on, on and uh, ask you if if there's any one last thing that we haven't yet covered that you think the audience uh, really needs to hear about this book, this challenge that we have in front of us. I mean, the roadway safety crisis is certainly a challenge and a rising one. Um, but I would ask your audience to not look at it alone. Accidental death, injury-related death, tracks with income inequality throughout history. Um, and that is true in all forms of injury-related death. Um, and when it comes down to it, the answers, the systemic answers that are going to solve all of these problems holistically start with a regulatory framework that holds corporations to account, automakers, but also pharmaceutical companies and corporate landlords and all the else. Um, and also a social safety net that allows people to have the resources to protect themselves, whether that's buying a new safer car um, or having a safer way to work, um, you know, or, or living in a safer home. And so I would really urge people who spend a lot of their time thinking about transportation and traffic to think about these systems holistically, because across the board, when we look at so-called accidents, our answer is to focus on personal responsibility and punishment and finding the last person who did wrong, whoever we can blame. And in that, missing the huge uh, potential we have for harm reduction, for reducing the harm of dangerous vehicles, dangerous homes, dangerous workplaces. Um, and if we think about these things holistically, if we refuse to accept the blame paradigm and put forth uh, you know, a, a desire for systemic answers, um, we can make progress across the board and also create real allyship between different communities that are fighting for safety in, in all these different environments, whether it's um, the reduction of drug overdose accidents or accidental fires or traffic accidents. Yeah. I think the, the very last thing that I'm going to ask you is, is sort of related to what we learned from the corporate environment, or, or at least part of the answer that we learned when we saw that the, um, the quote unquote liability, you know, began to shift and we saw the workers' compensation laws, you know, coming into place. And so we did see some legitimate changes to the dangerous workplace conditions that did exist. Um, it's not to say that they're perfect now, as you pointed out, but it, it leads me to believe or, or leads this, this question along the lines of, um, how we might be able to structure our communities to be designed safer. Um, you know, Jeff Speck, when I had him on the other day uh, on the podcast, one of the things that we talked about was he, he's waiting for when, you know, class action lawsuits are, are actually going to move forward to hold cities and engineers accountable for continuing to design roadways that encourage speeding and encourage, you know, in other words, if, if, if in fact design is that important and, uh, you know, I, I guess where, where I'm, I'm struggling to get this out, but it's like, it seems like that's going to have to be part of it is there's going to have to be some form of financial or liability, um, accountability to hold, um, cities, municipalities, designers, you know, accountable for creating safer systems. I think it's absolutely true. I mean, the truth is that corporations and governments won't do anything to protect us unless we financially force them to. Money is the only language they speak. Right. Um, you know, and um, there's two hopeful instances I'd like to leave you with. One is a, a case out of Arizona that the Arizona Supreme Court recently allowed to move forward, wherein um, a person, the family of a person killed in a crash, a rear end crash, is suing the automaker of the other vehicle. Because um, the person who owned the other vehicle opted out of the um, automatic emergency braking because it cost ten thousand um, dollars, and automatic emergency braking would have prevented this death. Um, and so, in that case, Ford may be financially liable for failing to install basic safety features, or rather, making basic life-saving safety features an expensive add-on only available to the wealthy. Um, I think there's a lot of hope in that case. There's also one in New York City that occurred in Garrettson Beach in Brooklyn, 
um, where uh, a young boy was um, struck and um, permanently disabled um, on his bicycle on a street that the New York City Department of Transportation knew was known for speeding. Um, the family was able to sue and hold the city liable for knowing a street was unsafe and failing to solve it. Um, and that was an expensive, expensive mistake um, that I think begins to push things forward. Um, but, you know, as we've seen from the regulatory um, framework, you know, we need a lot of good lawyers out there ready to take on these cases, you know, and if you look at like the Remington case recently uh, taken on by the Sandy Hook families, you know, that was led by a lot of remarkable lawyers willing to take on a giant case against a huge corporation, an expensive many year case um, to force that, you know, that liability. Um, and so it's going to take that kind of effort, but also from all of us, you know, you know, in both of those cases, the answer wasn't this driver is bad. It was this system is bad. Right. Um, this system that allows automakers to make unsafe cars and road engineers to design unsafe roads. Um, and for them all to know that that's true. Um, and so we're really going to have to force ourselves to take a deep breath in our anger and push that anger up into the systems that actually control um, who lives and who dies next time, who can actually prevent this from happening again. Yeah. Final, final thing. <laughs> um, you include in the book uh, a story about yourself um, falling off a cliff, and um, it it brought to mind something that has sort of transpired in our society um, in in the last few decades, and that's the helicopter parenting concept of you know parents you know rightfully so want to do everything they can to to, to keep their, their their children safe. And, um, but in, in some ways it's, it, it's like stifling of children, you know, from, from the standpoint of, and one of the things that Tim Gill and I talked about is, is really how do we, how do we design cities for kids and streets for kids so that they can once again be able to, you know, to develop that self-efficacy and self-confidence of being able to, to explore and get around and not have to be chauffeured around by parents in motor vehicles and, and, and have parents constantly hovering over them. When, when you thought back and you told that story and you, you know, you wrote it out cause you're, you're obviously remembering, you know, that event. And then you bring into it, you layer into that, the systems approach to it and, and, and the design that was part of that. Um, how do we as a society come to, to grips with that? Because that's one of the biggest challenges that, that, you know, we have when people, you know, say, well, in answer to the fact that, you know, kids hardly walk or bike to school anymore these days is, is, you know, they just don't feel safe. And some of it's stranger danger worries. And then some of it, or the most likely is they feel like it's not safe for them to walk or bike to school. Where do we yeah, go? I mean, I mean, yeah. they're, they're not wrong, right? No, exactly. I mean, it, yeah. it, it's not safe out there, but, um, but the changes do work. I remember one of the most remarkable results, um, there was a hotly contested protected bike lane that was in, put in um, alongside Prospect Park, where I live, near I live in mm -hmm. New York City, mm -hmm. um, the Prospect Park West Light bike lane. And it, it was hotly contested because a bunch of wealthy neighbors along the street, it's like really fancy real estate. They all sued the city over it. Yeah. Um, and the reason they installed the bike lane wasn't necessarily for cyclists. It was because there was so much speeding on the road and they right. needed to narrow the road, but it was also next to a park. Um, and all these things happened. Speeding declined, a sidewalk cycling decline, which is a great example. If you give people resources, right. they behave better. Um, but um, another thing that happened was that kids started biking themselves to soccer practice. Right. Yes. And, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you can imagine, you can even conjure that feeling of independence, right? Yes, yes, exactly. Um, and so, you know, I think I think one thing is like giving up on that perfectionism. Um, there's an epidemiologist named Dr. Sue Baker, who I like to reference a lot. Um, and she said to me, I'm paraphrasing, that we need to make the world safe for drunks. Right. Because when we make the world safe for drunks, we make it safe for sleepyheads, for people who aren't paying attention, um, for people who might not be as smart as you. Right. Um, when we make it safe for drunks, we build the world for drunks. Yeah. We make it safe for everyone. Yeah. And 
there's, I think that's a really interesting example because we like to hate drunks. We like to blame drunks, but also little kids are just like drunks. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, like they're a little slower on the uptake. They don't know yeah. everything. They're not paying as much attention as they should be. Um, so we can yeah. we can swap that for kids. But like that needs to be our thought process with our built environment. But instead, right, right now we have a world of perf- built for perfect people that is very dangerous. And we say parents, parents are responsible. Right. Um, and so I think parents are rightfully responding to a responsibility that they've a huge responsibility that they feel is put on them by society, a society that has negated and given up its ability to keep everyone safe. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. I love it. You are. I'm so delighted that you wrote this book. And uh, everybody, if you haven't already uh, picked one up, pick up your copy. Uh, I I listened to it on Audible, so it's it's a very good uh, quote unquote read via Audible as well. Uh, but uh, yeah, but also you know, pick up a copy too. And uh, Jesse, thank you so very much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. It's been a joy ch- chatting with you about a very difficult uh, subject, and uh, I'm sure a, a, a topic and a subject that was difficult to write about at times. It certainly was. Um but it's great to get to talk to like-minded people about it. I really appreciate you having me on. Thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Jesse Singer. I sure did. (laughs) And if you did, please give it a thumbs up. Uh, Leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Uh, Just click on that button down below and ring the notifications bell so that you can customize your notifications for future content that I'm producing and putting out there. And a quick reminder, uh, please stop on by the Active Town store to pick up your own Streets are for People swag. Uh, each and every purchase uh, does help out a great deal. We've got some t-shirts out there, some water bottles, um, some pint glasses, I think. It might be back in stock. <laughs> and uh, what else can I tell you about? Oh, Patreon, of course. <laughs> If you'd like to support the channel, please uh, consider becoming a, a patron and uh, part of the merry band of Active Towns ambassadors. Uh, for as little as a dollar a month, you can really help support my efforts to keep this content rolling along. And there's some nice perks. You can actually uh, gain access to all of this content uh, early and also commercial free. So. That's a bonus. <laughs> Thank you all so much for tuning in. And until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. Cheers.